I'm Dylan. And I'm Keon. And this is Trust Your Doctor, that podcast where we bring back a villain that probably no one even remembers because this week it's Domain of the Void. Written by Andrew Smith. Directed by Ken Bentley. <laughs> and released in September 2014. So uh, yeah, Andrew Smith, writer of Full, Full Circle. Circle. <laughs> that great and classic Adric story. Yeah, I was wondering where I recognized his name from. <laughs> He just uh, won't die. <laughs> ah, wow, that's a bit harsh. Well, I meant Adric, but yeah. Oh, okay. And, and Andrew Smith, too. <laughs> Ad- Adric does seem to always come back to haunt us, so. Yeah, as, as you'll see, four weeks from now on the podcast. <laughs> <clears throat> so, he also wrote a a story for the sixth Doctor that I guess never got produced called The First Sontarans, which is... Surprisingly about- not about the first something. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, surprisingly it's about the void now. <laughs> you says this weird and unexplained affinity for the Vord. I think he was given the brief to write a story about the Vord and was like, well, what interesting things can I do Wait, with the Vord? The Vord? <laughs> that was his first response. That was my first response. <laughs> yeah, it was your first response last week when you're like, Wait, who are the Vord? <laughs> right as soon as we ended recording. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember those nondescript villains from keys of marinus i just remember the last two good episodes of keys of marinus well at least he gave them some personality in this so they're no longer personality less black monsters yeah i was thinking <clears throat> while watching this because i didn't remember i was like was all this backstory and stuff about the vord in keys of marinus no. or did he just make it up for this no he made it up for this okay good so. well i mean not good but <laughs> like good for him i guess yeah, he said he sat down with a list of things he wanted to do for the Vord and questions that were left unanswered, like, <laughs> who, who are the, the hell were the Vord? <laughs> 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 so, it begins with, I think Dr. it begins- Dr. Susan, yeah, Ian, and Barbara. In the TARDIS. Reminding me once again that this was one of the best TARDIS <laughs> crews. Yeah, even though we've only got two of the four actors- yeah, well, I mean, that was pretty much the case for the actual show, too. You know, with how much they went on vacation and how much they just wrote their own characters out of the episodes. <laughs> well, they did that again here, but here I assume it's more out of necessity of the fact that they don't have Barbara and the Doctor than yeah. um, they need a vacation from filming for 52 weeks. <laughs> uh, um, so, right off the bat, I couldn't tell the difference between... William Russell and the Doctor and Caroline Ford and uh, Jacqueline Hill or Barbara, Barbara, whoever played Barbara. I don't know if it was Jacqueline it was, Hill. It was originally, yeah, but in this it was Caroline Ford. Yeah. And yeah, I couldn't tell the difference at all either, which is, I guess, why they started prefixing or suffixing all of the Doctor and Barbara's lines with the Doctor said <laughs> blank or Barbara said blank. <clears throat> um, I mean, they probably could do a pretty good impression. Um. But I guess it's just like age. Now they're the actual age of the character they're supposed to be <laughs> acting as. So their voice, I don't know. If you, you know what I mean, right? Yes. Well, I mean, both William Russell and Carolyn Ford's voices have actually definitely aged. Because you can really tell when you're listening to this that they sound a lot older than they were when they were on yeah. the show. Which isn't a bad thing because everybody ages. It's just something to point out that they sound older. Yeah, and... I don't know, maybe I'm just remembering, maybe I'm just remembering how I want to remember it, but I don't think in Quinnis, Carol Ann Ford was like, I don't think she sounded that different from how she was in Susan. Quinnis, maybe she made more of an attempt to sound like young Susan. I honestly don't remember either. But uh, yeah, it's, that's what it is. So there you go. Actually, I think my first note, let me just take my notes out so I can confirm this. Yeah, my, my first, first note is that William Russell sounds more like Herndall than he did Hartnell, which I thought was kind of funny. My first note is, oh god, Ian sounds like he uses a walker now. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> I don't think he actually does. I think William Russell's still all spry and walking around on two feet rather than six. <laughs> anyway. Um, they show up uh, in the hold of some ship. Yeah, they just materialize on a ship, and they get out, and they're like, hey, we're on a ship. Nice. And they get captured pretty much right away, and uh, 
as is fitting for a First Doctor serial thrown into a pre-existing conflict between attack, an invading force, and a defending force. Except for once the invading force has already won and conquered the entire planet except for this tiny... Well, I thought it was tiny flotilla of ship, but in episode two, they're like, we have hundreds of ships. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. So they're taken by um, Amira, I think. Yeah, Amira. Or Amira, yeah, whatever, the whatever daughter of it. the Admiral. Yeah. Um, so they're taken to another ship where the Admiral is. Yeah, the Fortitude, which is the, I guess, flagship. It's the biggest ship in the flotilla, so the Admiral's using it <clears throat> biggest as his ship flagship. Biggest the Tortilla? <laughs> 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 anyway, um, the this Admiral sort of explains what's going on. He's like, hey, this is Planet Hydra, a world covered entirely by sea with one continent. Yeah. So this is just actually a remake of Waterworld. Okay, no, no. <laughs> It's not. Waterworld didn't have a continent. It just had a base, I think. <laughs> a planet of water. Um, and he's like, hey, yeah, the Vord are uh, invading, and they're pretty much... They've taken yeah, over. Yeah, they won. Well, so, no, first he spends about five minutes being really, like, shifty about who's actually invaded the planet, because he doesn't know if the Dr. Susan, Ian, and Barbara are with the invaders, or if they're trying to take over the ship, or whatever, so... He's like, oh, yeah, we've been invaded, whatever, whatever. And then he's like, oh, yeah, it's the Vord. And then the doctor's like, what? And they're like, hey, we just dealt with the Vord. Yeah, a couple weeks ago on Marinus. Uh, this apparently makes the Vord chronologically the first monster that the doctor encounters twice. So, huh. Because the second encounter with the Daleks is in the story in which Susan leaves. Yeah, well, I mean... Which means that since Susan is in this, it has to be before that. Well, I mean, you can say, like, the Doctor encountered the Daleks, then went into, like, the Thal Forest, and then encountered them again in the same story. Yeah, but that doesn't really <laughs> count. Yeah, no, it doesn't. So... So, yeah, the Vord. Woo! Thanks, Andrew Woo. Smith. <laughs> 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 like I said, I think he just got the brief for a story with the Void with the Doctor Ian Barber and Susan was like, okay, I guess I'll write that. Um, so they need to go investigate something that's underwater for some reason. I really don't remember, but Ian is like, I'll do it. Oh yeah, no, there's a ship. There's like a submersible attacking them, and it sinks the ship with the TARDIS on. And they need to go down underwater because the ship's too fast for the sonar oh, yeah. to pick up, and they have to spot it by eye. Yeah, so Ian's like, hey, I'll go do that. And Doc's uh, like, no, 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 no. And Ian's like, well, we're kind of stuck here now, so... <laughs> yeah, bring that back that first Doctor thing of him just shutting down everything everyone says. Yeah, and also that first Doctor thing where instead of just not using the TARDIS, they completely put it out of commission <laughs> for four episodes. Well, yeah. really two, but... Uh, Yeah, well, kind of. Um, So Ian puts on the diving suit thing. And he goes down. Uh, yep. And uh, the Vord attack. <laughs> the submersible is attacking them. And they describe it, I think, as like an underwater zeppelin is what it looks like or something. Huh. But it's zooming by, attacking the divers. Yeah, how I imagined this entire audio was weird. Because I imagined like this part, um, I guess just all of part one, as having the production values of like season one. Oh, no. And then like starting in part two, it got like really expensive in my mind <laughs> uh, yeah and turned into color <laughs> just became color in the middle of the story yeah the cover for the story is like predominantly purple so that kind of messed with me when i was trying to imagine and i was like man i keep imagining things as purple because the cover of the story is purple i don't know why i did that yeah, the cover has the first Doctor's face, like most of the covers do have the Doctor's face, and then it has like this. Well, it has I mean it has William Hart William Hartnell's face, and then it has this other dude who's obviously not William Hartnell. His face kind of looks like uh, our president, <laughs> President Trump. <laughs> Hang I on mean, a minute. Just, just just ignore the the hair. Just look at the him in profile, and just look at his his face portion. I mean, I only... Oh, oh, that guy. Yeah. The guy on the left. Yeah. Oh. No, the guy on the right. On the right? You mean William Russell? No, no, here. 
Yeah, just just look that's, at his... That's that's Hartnell in profile. It doesn't look like him. It looks like some other dude they got to just pose as him. Yeah, that seriously doesn't look like him at all. Yeah, that's Hartnell in profile. I don't know. It, I don't it know is about that. It is. I'm not sure about that. It doesn't really look like him, honestly. Uh, it does to me. I mean, it doesn't to me. Looks I don't exactly know. We, like we can, him to me. We can look it up if there's any information about it out there, but yeah. I mean, just take a look at it yourself. Looks like him to me. Mm. So, um, anyway, the ship uh, snags Ian. Yeah, Ian gets uh, caught on the ship, and this part was weird because the narration is like Ian was caught on the ship and his oxygen had run out, and he still had a hundred feet left to go underwater. And I mean, I guess he'd already been holding his breath for a while, but I think I can hold my breath for a hundred feet. I'm not sure. I was trying to think because. A couple of years ago, I don't know if I could do it now, but a couple of years ago, um, you know the pool right over here by... Yeah. You can bleep that out yeah. if you want. Um, <laughs> not that anyone would know or care, but... Um, yeah, I swam the whole entire length of that underwater without taking a breath, and I think that's probably about 100 feet or a little more. Yeah. Well, I think in this case, it's 100 feet upwards to the surface rather than 100 feet lengthwise. Uh-huh. <clears throat> um... But also, he's trying to hold on for his life onto the submersible, which is trying to shake him, so... Yeah, I mean... Yeah. But, uh, yeah, he surfaces and starts fighting this... Vo- he starts fist-fighting this Vord. Yeah. So, saw this trailer for uh, Fist Fight, that movie, the other oh, day. Oh, God. I guess it's coming out on DVD or something, but... Uh, yeah, anyway, that has nothing to do with this. No, also, that movie looked terrible. <laughs> didn't end up seeing it because of that. I think it has Ice Cube in it. Yeah, it does. <laughs> so, meanwhile, on the Fortitude, it's been hit by a torpedo. And it's going down, down, down. Okay. Oh, my God. <laughs> the it doctor's is. staying in the sonar room because the guy who was at the sonar. Apparently, the sonar is manufactured by Starfleet because it blows up as soon as there's any sight of danger. <clears throat> Apparently, the doctor's staying at the sonar because someone else told him not to, and he can't listen to anyone else, of course, so he has to stay there. He's also trying to get in contact with Ian because <laughs> Ian's radio line got severed. Don't know why they have, like, a radio line instead of using actual wireless radio with these divers, but... Maybe they don't have... <clears throat> I don't know. Whatever. This is pretty far in the future. Yeah, but it's also another planet, so who knows what the heck they have. <laughs> True. So... The ship's going down. Doctor's in the sonar room. Barbara puts Susan on a lifeboat and is like, I'm going to go with the doctor. i got to go get him to come on the lifeboat because otherwise we're going to lose him too. So she goes and the ship sinks with Barbara and the doctor stuck in the sonar room. Yeah. Susan's like, oh no. And then part one ends. And then part two kind of picks up. Part two picks up a couple minutes or hours after part one because all of a sudden Ian's back yeah. on the ship with the void caption. I was like, wait a minute, did I miss something? Yeah. I did that too. Uh, <clears throat> kind of weird. Kind of a weird decision. This, I mean, I mean, maybe maybe we both just missed a line of narration that was just like, and then they ca- <laughs> caught back up with Ian and rescued maybe. him. Maybe, but the part two actually also takes place over a couple months. Yeah, so. that was kind of weird. <laughs> I mean, I guess there's no real reason why they couldn't have a story over a couple months in the TV show, but they pretty much never do it. So. Yeah, I guess it's just Except because... maybe the Romans. Yeah. Which, which the Romans wasn't really over a couple months. It was just like, hey, we've been here for a couple months and now there's this story. Yeah, most of the stories on the TV show, for whatever reason, seem to take place over, you know, a hours. day or a couple days at most. Yeah. But there's always, like, some indication that the Doctor spent a lot of time doing other things. Like, for example, in the most recent season, he's at a university and the lady's like, oh, you've been teaching here for 50 years. And it's like... Okay, so off screen he spent 50 years at this university, but now we're going to see a story that takes place within one day. <clears throat> yeah, and I mean, I don't really know why that is. Yeah, especially not, since Pretty they... much nothing stopping any of the writers from writing a story that takes place over, like, a month, so... Especially since they have a time machine that yeah. they can just... They can land somewhere and then put it out of commission like they did in this story. <laughs> Genesis of the Daleks took place over a couple days. Yeah, there, I mean, there are a lot that take place over a couple of days, I think. Yeah, but, I mean, be hard-pressed to think of one that takes place over more than a week, maybe. Yeah, I don't think I can think of any. How about one that takes place in real time? 
should make that. There is. There's there's one in the reboot called 42, which takes place pretty close to wow, real time over the 42 minutes, minutes wow. of the episode. Huh. <laughs> Isn't that one of the most hated episodes or something? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't listen to fan wisdom about the reboot. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I don't either. I'm probably just pulling that out of my ass. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. The guy who wrote that episode is taking over a showrunner for season 11 of the reboot. So Great. You haven't even seen the episode yet. Yeah. Okay. So Ian goes to talk to the prisoner while they take him to take talk to that. Yeah, they take him to talk to the prisoner. Yeah, they've taken a board prisoner. Um, that was another Ian, thing that happened off screen, I think. I think well, it's the one who Ian beat up on the <laughs> ship. Uh, yeah, this is Nebrin. And Ian's like, hey, we totally owned you guys back on Marinus. <laughs> so... Debrin's like, oh, huh, Marinus, that was with Yartek, right? And I was like, man, who even remembers Yartek? <laughs> yeah, apparently that was a hundred years ago. Except you don't find that out t- till episode three or four, I think. Yeah, something like that. It's supposed to be this big reveal, like, I mean, as an audience, you know, cause it's because they have a time machine, but the Void are like, how were you on Marinus a hundred years ago? Yeah, didn't really get why they made a big deal about that, because it wasn't really an interesting point of the story. I guess it proves to Tarlac and Nebrun that the TARDIS actually is a time machine. Oh, yeah, I guess. So um, Nebrun, he only tells Ian his name. My name's Nebrun. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty uh, He's pretty calm and cool for a prisoner, I guess, which I guess makes sense later when you find out why. why but I didn't really think it was that weird. I was just like, oh, he's cool with being a prisoner okay yeah yeah um susan talks to him too (laughs) yeah she sneaks into his cell or like the jail room not his cell but like you know what i mean i imagine it is like an interrogation room (laughs) just a table and four walls with a door and that's just how i imagined it tiny lamp shining in his face (laughs) yes with susan doing the good cop bad cop thing well susan would be the good cop ian would be the bad cop in this situation no i think ian would be the good cop and susan would be the bad cop yeah okay yeah <laughs> um, susan tells oh Nebrin, yeah i totally forgot about this is that in part one they totally shoehorned in barbara's history knowledge where the, um just like the com- they did in the show <laughs> the commander talks about how they've been fighting the board for a while and she's just like oh this is just like that time in history that nobody remembers except me (laughs) (laughs) Uh, yeah (laughs) yeah that was a bit i don't know this story really tried to emulate the feel of seasons one and possibly two yeah it really succeeded yeah Especially, especially since the doctor and barbara actually don't come back until the end so again neglecting two of the main characters for the entire story well, I mean, like I said, that's more to do with they don't have Jacqueline Hill and yeah, but it's, it's still, to play the part. It's, but it's, it's still, yeah. I mean, it's still like the old yeah, era. Yeah, it is. They recast Barbara now for the next season of these that they did. Huh. Um, is Jacqueline Hill still alive? I don't no, know. No, she's not. Oh. She passed away. I guess that would explain why she doesn't play Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> might, might. They also, like... The music especially is really 60s in this. There's a lot of xylophones and bongos, yeah, like, on the show. Ex- except <laughs> it's the Ronnie again. <laughs> uh, I forgot to mention this last week, but the bongo showed up in the Anachronauts, too. Uh, just imagine some guy in the audio studio with his bongos off the side. You mean the, the Ronnie, right? Yeah. I mean, Kato Morrow, yeah. right? <laughs> She's sitting off the side playing her with bongos. And play, sorry, pay five times as much as they would if they'd just gotten some random nobody to play the bongos uh, but no the music in this um yeah i guess it was kind of similar to the original series music or like season one music but at the same time it was way more fitting than classic doctor who music that's also true <laughs> you're correct on that point because um, it wasn't just like synths blaring at the, at worst the most possible. inopportune time. Yeah. So anyway, a couple months pass. They're on the <laughs> Ford, ship. Uh, no, the, the Fortitude got destroyed. Now they're on the Reliant, I think. 
Yeah, something like that. They they're trying to make their way to the one like landmass on the planet, um, and they do. They eventually get there and um, immediately get captured. Well, they don't well, not get right captured. away. They they start walking through the city. It's a pretty creepy and pretty interesting scene. They the decide to take Nebrin with them for whatever reason. They're like, we want to take Nebrin with us as well, a prisoner, so if we encounter the Void, we can yeah. just kill him and use him as a hostage. Well, I mean, they wouldn't kill him. They'd use him as a hostage. Because they just and kill they them. kill they him if they the don't hostage. comply. I, I mean, maybe. But, um, yeah, they, they kind of think it's a trap, and it is one. Duh. <laughs> There's no one there. They're walking through this empty town. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, Vord appear. Uh, I kind of imagined the town like uh, like a seaside town in Italy. Yeah, I kind of did too. I kind of imagined it as um, Nabu, a cross between Nabu <laughs> and um, like that one place in Greece with the blue roofs on the houses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it's called. <laughs> uh, I know what you. Th- I know what you're talking about, though. So they get to. I guess this is kind of built almost on a hill. Kind of reminds me of that city from Lord of the Rings, but the palace is kind of at the top of this hill in the center, I guess, where you can see the yeah. entire rest of the city from kind the Kind of palace. reminds me of the Citadel or main dojo or whatever it was from Kung Fu Panda. That you had to climb like a thousand <laughs> stairs just to get to. Yeah. So they they get taken to the palace and they're like, Susan, you're going to give us the key to the TARDIS yeah, we didn't mention that, that we have in the garden. Was the one who planned all of this and was psychically communicating yeah. with his Vord buddies. <laughs> I don't remember if that was in Keys of Marinus, but uh, yeah, he can do that. No. In Keys of Marinus, the Vord is just dudes in uh, kind of crappy uh, wetsuits with some <laughs> horns on. So, Caroline Ford talks about this in the interview. She's like, oh, yeah, the, the Void, when we were filming them, was hilarious because they never saw where they were going. They kept colliding with things. They had big flippers for feet, so they walked really funny all the time. Yeah, it was a great time. <clears throat> so they, while well, they get taken to the TARDIS in the garden. In yeah, the they're like, aha, we have the TARDIS. We salvaged it from the ship, and now we're going to use it for ourselves. For our like, but how would you even know to salvage the TARDIS? There was a bunch of junk in that ship. And they're like, ah, uh, ah, uh, they're on to us, run! Okay, no. They actually reveal how later. Yeah, so... But um, they get, like, attacked, I think, by some... More void. Yeah, and uh, in the confusion, Ian and Susan somehow make their way into the TARDIS. Yeah, because the Admiral the tells them to leave because he doesn't... He He's learned from Ian that it's a time and space machine, and he doesn't want the Void to get access to time travel. As you know, most people don't want most villains in this show to get access to time travel. Um, well, it's not really been that big of a thing. Maybe just like in this and the Anachronauts and a couple other stories. Yeah. I mean, they. I think with the Daleks, they did it too. They're like, we don't want yeah. the Daleks to get access to time travel. Then the Daleks just built their own time machine in the chase anyway, so. <clears throat> oh, yeah, the chase. Classic Peter Purvis. <laughs> story <laughs> so they get into the TARDIS and apparently Ian either knows how to pilot the TARDIS or knows how to pull switches to convincingly make the TARDIS leave because it starts dematerializing yeah that was kind of weird too um, I'm not sure how I remember this when I barely remember anything from that era but I did go like hey wait a minute I didn't know Ian could pilot the TARDIS I mean not even the doctor can pilot the TARDIS at this point Yeah, supposedly but, uh, eh. So, yeah, part two, the cliffhanger is the dematerializing. And Susan's like, no, we got to go back. And Ian's like, we got to leave. We're going to die if we don't leave. Also, we don't want them to have access to time travel. Yeah. Uh, I think at this point, someone already told them or they already guessed that the doctor and Barbara are dead. Yeah, well, they just assumed they were dead. But in part three, Susan hits, I guess, like the emergency stop or something. And then she's like, I think the doctor's still alive. And Ian's like... Why? Yeah, why? <laughs> and she, and Susan's she, because like he's the main character, and also this was made in 2014. We already know that there's more after this, Ian. You dumbass. Okay, no, she doesn't. Say Maybe that. they make a divergent <laughs> timeline where the doctor dies here. Um, but no, the real reason why what she says is that um, Nebrin name dropped the doctor when she never told him the doctor's name. She always said grandfather. So she's like, maybe he's been psychically communicating with someone who's been interacting 
with the doctor. This is a pretty big jump. And also, <laughs> when I was hearing this, I was like, didn't Ian call him the doctor when he was talking with Nebrin? Probably not. I mean, I didn't go back and listen to it or anything. I mean, Ian I didn't was even all think like, that, but Ian was like, I didn't call him the doctor when I was talking with Nebrin. But it's like, I'm sure Ian called him the doctor at some point and Nebrin heard. So it seems like it seems like it shouldn't make sense the the well, deductions I'm... that Susan's making because well apparently Nebrin he didn't just picked so... it up for uh-huh. Ian but so Ian's like okay I guess we'll just go surrender <laughs> so they do and then Susan hands over the key and the void try to get into the TARDIS and they can't and like hey they're bringing back that thing they introduced in the Daleks and never mentioned again which is that <laughs> only Susan and the Doctor know how the TARDIS key works. <laughs> Um, yeah, meanwhile, Amira and, um, the Admiral dude are like, no, you doomed us all! Well, no, Amira escapes over the wall, but the Admiral gets shot and stunned. So he's like, yeah, you doomed us all, but Amira, she escapes no. to join the Resistance. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a Resistance movement also bringing back that classic First Doctor, uh, thing of every story needs to have a Resistance movement. Yeah, why not? <laughs> why not? <laughs> So anyway, um, Ian and Susan get captured, and I guess this is another couple days or weeks later. They get uh, separated. Yeah, Susan gets taken to be a more important prisoner or something, and Ian gets put in hard labor with the Admiral. <laughs> Sucks for Ian. Ian took quite a battering in episode one with that sub hitting him and he gets beat up by Nebrin. Yeah, this is an Ian story, because yeah. season one and two... Uh, Doctor Who has character stories. Yeah, yeah. If you know what I mean. Yeah, they focus on specific characters. Yeah. So <clears throat> when it's a Barbara story, though, <laughs> just like all right, I guess I'm few, skipping those this are one. Few, few and far between. <laughs> uh, yeah, because Barbara didn't do anything much like in this story. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I think they name drop it here, but you don't really know what it is. Or maybe they don't name drop it. They the just sort of vaguely, engine. yeah. They're like the Vord are trying to fix something or the other, and it's on a beach. <clears throat> Damn, and these Ian's like, people. well, life's a beach. <laughs> not so right you now. Might as it's well not. swim. <laughs> nah, I'd prefer to sink. Uh, all right. I was trying to make a Smash Mouth reference here, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because Smash Mouth has totally been relevant since that one time they're in Shrek. Yeah, but the line from the song is like, uh, what, oh, the water's getting warm, so you might as well swim. <laughs> Man, I read an article once, that the entire premise of the article was that Shrek totally killed Smash Mouth's chances at being a legitimate artist because they just became a joke after but that's, Shrek. that song was in like multiple movies during that period. <laughs> I think. Yeah. Plus, they already made their millions, so who gives a sh- But Shrek was the biggest one. Yeah, I guess. I mean, and also Shrek, you know, Shrek. <laughs> I don't know what that means, actually. <clears throat> I do. <laughs> anyway, um, I think now... Uh, Smash Mouth should appear on Doctor Who. Sorry, I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, so um, when The Rock starts playing the Doctor, you know that Smash Mouth mouth should compose a new doctor who theme never put us in charge of the show (laughs) we will ruin it quicker than physically possible no we'll save it we'll bring back bring doctor who back from the depths it's fallen to by now (laughs) by casting the rock as the doctor and having smash mouth perform the opening theme yeah duh you know, now that you say it like that, it's a surprise that nobody's thought of it so far. It's such an obvious thing to do to make the show a hundred times better. We'll bring back William Russell as the companion a hundred years after he left. Uh, sure. Yeah. Why not? We can redesign the Daleks as, uh... Humanoid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can make the Doctor half human while we're at it. <clears throat> Yep. Anyway. And bring back to Ghana. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, I think now we're introduced to Tarlac. Yeah, because the big airship flies in. Yeah, so this was kind of like that scene in episode five where the Emperor shows up. So Tarlac meets Nebrin. Nebrin's apparently this super important dude. 
Yeah, Nebun's apparently the like some general or something. The upstart of Void, I guess. <laughs> oh god. To make a reference. <laughs> um because he's like the second in command who wants to be the number one, but Tylex the number one. Tylex's like, no, 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 Nebrin. Not on my watch, Nebrin. Nebrin does kind of upstart Void it later because he uh, totally saves. He totally ruins the Void race or the <laughs> Void invasion of Hydra by basically giving the Doctor ten more seconds to do what he needs to do. Anyway, Tarlac, um, his voice sounds pretty cool. I don't know who plays him because I didn't look up the cast for this, but he kind of sounds like Tom Baker when he yells. <laughs> um, we didn't actually mention the Void all have these kind of... Masks. Masks, but also like cyberized voices. Oh, Tarlac's played by the same guy who played Admiral Jonas. Huh. Um, yeah, I don't think the Void costumes, which you can see on the cover of this, look the same as the ones from Keys of Marinus. No, I don't remember those like shiny crystal crown things they've got going on on the cover for this. Yeah, I don't remember the helmet thing either. I mean, I can vaguely remember what the Vord looked like originally. I think they had a helmet, but I don't think it was like as important as it was here, or I don't think it was designed like it was on the cover of this. So, yeah, whatever. I do remember the big like hoop antenna things that they have going on. I do remember that from the hmm. TV episode. Since that was kind of the only thing that made them stand out from divers in wetsuits. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I kind of forget what happens next. I think they bring Susan to the engine or something. Well, so we see, no, we see, uh, it's revealed that Vexel was a traitor. Oh yeah, Vexel was the Vord spy. On the uh, ships. Yeah. And that's how the Vord knew their plan of action at all times, and that's how they salvaged the TARDIS, because Vexel put a beacon on it for them to go get it later. So... Yeah, he's decided he wants to become a Vord, so they gather all the prisoners up to watch. Yeah. And he has his Vord, like, indoctrination ceremony where he puts on the Vord helmet and becomes a Vord. Yeah, so the Vord helmet's kind of interesting because it's it, it makes you a Vord and connects you psychically with all the other Vord. But basically, so you put it on and the Vord mask decides if you really want to become a void or not. And you have to want to become a void for the mosque to accept you. And if you Otherwise, don't, you just like die or something. Well, so it's seriously injured. Or something yeah. He, like that. They explain that it's got like all these, um, things on the mosque that like poke into your skin and join with your brain. And yeah. if the mosque deems you unworthy, it rips it off your face, which could cause serious disfigurement or death, depending how far along in the process the mosque got before it ripped itself off your face. Yeah. So pretty dangerous thing here, but, um, apparently he really wants to become a Vord because it works. Yeah. <laughs> um, and this is explained, I think, a little later, but we can just talk about it now, mm-hmm. is that the Vord um, are trying to make every, I guess, living thing in the universe a Vord because that's yeah. how they think they're going to wipe out conflict. So I guess their hearts are in the right place. They're like, you know, we want to end war. And by doing that, we're going to make everyone uh, uh, like us. Yeah, I was thinking so about kind of this. kind of Nazi-ish, I guess. Like, well, without everyone who isn't us. They're a lot like the Cybermen. Because the Cybermen want to convert everybody as well. But I think the motivation is what makes them interesting for different reasons. Like, the Cybermen want to convert everybody because they believe that machines are the higher form of evolution, I guess. And that cold logic is above everything. But the Void, on the other hand, want to convert everybody because they want to try... They're trying to bring peace to the galaxy. <clears throat> Yeah. Which, I don't know, I thought that was interesting. I thought it made the Void pretty interesting in the story, actually. Like, I'm surprised Andrew Smith took this no-name villain and actually gave them an interesting, like, I guess, story um, gimmick slash motivation. Um, gimmick is kind of a bad word for it, but... It's <clears throat> it's not really a gimmick, it's more of just, like, a motivation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's what they're doing, and yeah, obviously, Susan and Ian want to stop that. <laughs> They I mean, don't want to get voided. Yes, also because most of the people on the planet don't want to become void, so they'll just get killed by the moss. Yeah, so um, also a lot of the void in this story are just other races that became void. Yeah, they talk about how Tarlac and Nebrin are natural-born void. So the void were some species on some planet, uh, presumably Marinus. I think it's implied to be Marinus, but probably some other place. Uh <laughs> 
they were naturally born void and then they developed the suits and put them on themselves and they call the other non-natural born void the void creatures yeah i don't actually remember that in this story but that could be like a pretty interesting thing to do for another story is have like this uh conflict between like the natural void and the non-natural void yeah yeah that could be interesting if they ever bring the void back again <laughs> yeah i guess i can't believe i'm saying this but like yeah bring the void back do it <laughs> yeah i'd actually kind of like to see them with any of the fourth through seventh doctors i think because we've we've only seen them with the first doctor and i'm curious or, to see like how or even in the reboot you know bring yeah. them back to the tv show yeah or even in I the mean, reboot if they go with something like this they could be pretty interesting and if they don't just go with like the hey we're guys in wetsuits <laughs> <laughs> i know they bringing them back kind of for an eighth doctor audio but it's not like the whole void race it's just a void gets stranded on earth hmm. and um so that's the plot of that eighth doctor story but that's the only other time they've appeared in performed medium there's a comic that implies the void become the cybermen which i don't buy into <clears throat> yeah that so, comic also uh, kills off jamie by the way uh wow he dies to save the world. Wow. <laughs> wow. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Ian and the Admiral escape at this part because the Void are taking them... They're actually taking them to the labor camp now. They were in a cell before and the Void like, we're going to take you to labor camp now. And in the process, the, I almost called him the Ian. Ian and the Admiral see a chance and to escape the Admiral, and escape. He's a companion now. Okay. okay. No. <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> The Vord, they're a companion now. No, okay, no. Um, That's not how that slip works. <laughs> yeah, maybe the... Since you mention it, maybe the Vord are actually members of Slipknot. They have those masks and stuff, so... Uh, yeah. <laughs> when you said Slipknot, I just thought of Slipknot from Suicide Squad, who only shows up to get killed two minutes later. Yeah, I don't remember him. Then again, I pretty much blocked Suicide Squad from my memory. He's the rope guy. He shows up, and they're like, oh man, he's the rope guy. Yeah, and no. then he's like, I'm going to escape, and they blow up his head. No idea who that is. <laughs> then again, I'm never going to watch Suicide Squad again, so whatever. <clears throat> so, yeah, episode three ends with... We didn't mention that Andrew Smith gave all the episodes individual titles like the TV show. So once again, emulating the TV show, they... Um, yeah. You don't hear the individual titles on the disc, but They're they, have, they on, have them on the Big Finish website and on the wiki. Yeah. I don't remember what they are, but yeah. Yeah, they're also not that important, so... Yeah, anyway, so episode three ends with Susan finding Barbara, and Barbara's like, the doctor's dead. So the cliffhanger yeah. to episode three is suspiciously similar to the cliffhanger to episode one. Yeah, also, it's not really a great cliffhanger because, well, one, the doctor's dead is never, or the doctor's about to die is never really a good cliffhanger. And two, no. for this, at this point in the story, you know he's not going to die because he has to come back to finish the first yeah. through 12th doctor's <laughs> runs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also, at some point in part four, Tarlac and... Uh, Nebrin. Uh, Nebrin, or maybe it's Vexel, I don't remember, are talking, and they're like, we had to convince Barbara that the Doctor was dead. Oh, no, yeah, that was Tarlac and Nebrin, because Tarlac... Yeah, so Barbara thinks the Doctor's dead because the Doctor hasn't shown up, and because they killed all the people who were working to save the Doctor, because he put himself into a coma to heal himself. Um, yeah. But then later, Tarlac's talking with Nebrin, and he reveals that actually, the Doctor wasn't dead, he was in a coma... So, such a deep coma that his life signs were barely readable so they thought he was dead and so they stopped the guard and then he woke up and left he just walked out and so he had to kill all the people who were working on the doctor to keep it secret nebrin's all you killed our own vord what ty likes like yes yeah. we have to not give the hydrants hope yeah and uh Tarlac does some more questionable things that go against Vord, like, policy or whatever. Yeah, honestly, Nebrun was a way better commander than Tarlac was, because as soon as Tarlac shows up, the entire Void occupation falls apart. <sighs> yeah, well, yeah, he was just doing whatever he thought was right, so... Tarlac's also super upset that they killed Yartek, because apparently Yartek was his, like, brother. But then, he's, but then later he's like, all natural born Void of the First Blood are brothers. Yeah. He says, like, he mentions, like, the Vord blood tree or 
whatever. I guess that's just, yeah, I didn't think of this while watching it, but I guess it's just like a family tree or something, but yeah. Yeah, I thought it was an actual thing. Should go to the Vord planet and bring back the blood tree. The blood tree, jeez. It's just a tree that's bleeding 24-7. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, yeah, I kind of forget what happens now. I think Barbara and Susan bug well, off okay. to go do their own thing. So, Tarlac's all... Okay, Tarlac's like, I think I know who's giving the rebel advice. And you're like, oh, it's the doctor, isn't it? It's going to be the doctor. And then Ian finds the rebels with the Admiral. And Amira's like, come with us. We'll take you to our base. <laughs> And they're like, oh, yeah, we found some great leadership. And Ian's all, I'd like to meet this leader. And then the docs are like, oh, but you already have my boy, Chesterton. Uh, Chesterfield. Not going to lie. I was pretty happy when the doctor showed up. <clears throat> uh, uh, Sure. Probably number one moment of the story for me. It's like, oh, man. All right. I don't know why. Doctor but... being pretty heroic. First doctor was never really that overtly heroic. And here he is saving these people. Eh. <clears throat> yeah, you I could argue really that care. he's only doing it because he wants to get back to the TARDIS, but whatever. Yeah. I didn't really think it was that big of a deal. So, yeah, the first Doctor's like, yeah, so I've been helping these guys uh, stop the Vord, and we've got a plan. I know what the sea engine's for. Tar- like- it's, it's to. I still don't know what it's for. It's to make the Vord more powerful or something like that. Well, so Tarlac... Like- Explains it to Susan and Barbara as a machine that'll convert the hydrogen and water to energy. And the doctor's like, well, I know what it's really for. It's actually going to expand the Void's psychic field. Because the Void have, like, a maximum distance their psychic field can, like, reach. And because they've been, you know, dependent on their psychic field for so long while they're on Hydra, the the strength is weakening. So the circle's growing smaller. They call it the call. Like, are you in call? Circle. Okay, no. If you're in call, you're in range of uh, a Tarlac, I guess. And the sea engine's going to expand that range so it covers the whole planet, so there'll be no place where they can't basically control the, the Vord. Huh. Well, okay then. Yeah. So, Doctor has his plan to go destroy it, and while he's there, he'll do some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> he actually doesn't explain what it is till they're there, and he's doing it. But Tarlac <clears throat> decides to call the Doctor's bluff. Because there's view screens all over the city that Tarlac and the Doctor are just battling over. Because the Doctor's like, I'm coming for you, Tarlac. And Tarlac's like, well, I'm coming for you, Doctor. Never mind, I'm just going to kill Susan. The Doctor's like, oh, God damn it. Yeah, I'm pretty vague as to what happens at the end of this. Well, okay, so uh, basically... They, they lead some attacks or whatever, but... Yeah, yeah, very simple. Susan's going to be forced to put the Void mask on. And Nebrin's like, we don't do this. This isn't us. They have to want to become Vord, to become Vord. And, and Tarlac's just like, yeah, screw off, Nebrin. <laughs> so they've got all the people assembled. The Vord are all guarding the city because they think the Doctor's coming to the city, but he's actually going to the sea engine. Ha <laughs> ha, who would have thought? But they send some of the rebels to attack the city. And the Doc's like, no killing anybody. Stun settings only. No stun settings. Murder only. <laughs> In an alternate universe. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't remember the first Doctor ever making a huge deal about not killing people, but like the later yeah. Doctors did. I don't but... remember the third Doctor ever making a huge deal about not killing people. <laughs> <laughs> Man, still got to get those cheap shots in. <clears throat> but the later Doctors definitely did make that a bigger deal, I think. Yeah, I mean, they kind of just picked and yeah. choosed when most of the time. But, but... Overall, yeah, they kind of did fall on the side of like, yeah, let's not kill people. So they're about to put the mask on Susan and Vexel has captured the Doctor and Ian and then Nebrin knocks the mask out of (laughs) Tylek's hand and he's like, we don't do this. Hero we need but didn't deserve. I don't know. Anyway, Tylek starts beating up Nebrin. (laughs) They start fist fighting. And uh, the Doctor like feedback loops the sea engine so... All of the non-natural born void basically get knocked out by the psychic field, and but all the natural born void are totally fine. So all the people rise up and basically tie up Nebrin and Tarlac, and that that's it. That ends the occupation and the blow yep. up the sea engine. There's still like five minutes in the story left when they do that psychic feedback loop. So they try to make it really exciting by having the doctor running away from the explosion. And you're just like, why do I care? 
Yeah, I mean... It's also not as cool as, as it would be on TV. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Note to self, running away from explosions, not as cool in audio-only form. Um, so, apparently the Hydra are going to bring peace back to their planet. By- but maybe not. Maybe they <laughs> totally fail. We don't know. There's only one continent. How hard can it be? <laughs> They uh, tie yeah, up all of well, wood, I guess. I'm sure there's some planet out there with, like, thousands of continents. And they're like, there's only seven continents. How hard could it be? <laughs> <laughs> they're not wrong. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> yeah, but they don't stick around to see the results of this. So, you know, maybe they totally, fa- maybe they totally fail and they actually just helped make everything worse. Well, they don't really say what they do to the Void either. They're just like, we'll take care of the Void. <laughs> we'll take care of them, wink, wink. Well, actually, I think they mentioned that the, like, at least the non-natural born Void will face the galactic court. Yeah, the natural born Void will just be thrown in Guantanamo and they'll call it a day. Gitmo. <laughs> You think they have Gitmo and Hydra? Yeah. I mean... <laughs> Susan accidentally lets slip, or Barbara accidentally lets slip this dangerous torture facility, and the Hydra's like, that's a pretty good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and now that we have time travel technology, we're free to conquer the known universe. Ha <laughs> uh, uh, But no, they just leave, and that's pretty much the end of that. Yeah, so the Void do show up in a comic book yeah, recently like, um, where it's shown that they actually side with the Time Lords in the in the last Great Time War, which is basically Time Lords versus Daleks with time travel, electric boogaloo. Um, anyway, huh. yeah, apparently the Void side with the, with the Time Lords, which I was surprised by, since I'm pretty sure they're one of the like two races that actually sided with the Time Lords. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, yeah, so. Yeah, pretty, pretty interesting story, you know. Uh, there were actually a lot of boring parts, in my opinion, (laughs) especially in part three and four. I guess emulating that first (laughs) season feel. And yeah, I think the biggest interesting part about this story is how much it emulated the, like, season one and two, Mm -hmm. whereas all the other audios we listened to pretty much didn't emulate their own seasons, so. Yeah, yeah. I actually think this style of storytelling, which is like, you know, it's the full cast, but you get all these interludes like, oh, the doctor went to blank or Ian was standing on the ship. Yeah, we didn't mention that <clears throat> even though it's, this is narrated by Caroline Ford and uh, William, D- Russell. William Russell, it's uh, like a third person narrator and they just switch back and forth. Yeah, and I actually think that's probably my favorite way that they've done these things so far. Because I think it's a nice cross between the full cast and the Companion Chronicles style thing. Because <clears throat> then they don't, yeah, well, they don't really have to be that clunky with the dialogue anymore. Like, oh, look, a ship with black fins coming towards us at approximately five kilometers a second. Yeah, that's true. But, I mean, people always say they hate that kind of stuff. But I don't mind it, honestly, when they're like, oh, look, we're on a beach. And I'm just like, okay. I don't really mind it. I just like this better. Yeah. I <clears> guess <throat> this is like, I mean, if you really want to try and emulate that feel of the classic show what uh, to what extent you know depends on the story but then if you want like a better look into the companions then you know listen to the companion chronicles yeah. or whatever so i think that actually that the reason why the story is done in that way is partially because they don't have jacqueline hill and william hartnell but also because they're kind of trying to emulate the soundtrack reconstructions of missing stories where they basically took the soundtrack for the story and had one of the people in the story record linking narration because if you just listen to the, the soundtrack, you wouldn't know what was going on on screen. I think that's what they're trying to emulate here with the narration. Yeah, I don't know about that. Um, I'm pretty sure it actually is what they're kind, what they're at least inspired by anyway, because I'm pretty sure I read that somewhere. So, <clears throat> kind of weird how the Void is super similar to the Cybermen, though. Trying to convert all the people to be. Yeah, well, he had to take him somewhere, and, <laughs> and he I wasn't think it worked. That much to work with. Like I said earlier, I think it worked because he differentiated them from the Cybermen enough. It's like you have to want to become a void to become a void. Whereas the Cybermen are like, well, you don't care if you want to become a Cyberman. We're gonna cyber convert you anyway. We don't cyber care if you want to become a Cyberman. Cyber, we are gonna cyber convert you cyber anyway. <laughs> God damn it, cyber, <laughs> cyber. God damn it. <laughs> 
yeah, all around interesting story. And you can email us at thedoctordecadentvegetable.com. Questions, comments, concerns, angry rants, love letters. Your thoughts on the Vord, the greatest Doctor Who villain of all time. Should they come back? Yes. I mean, yes. They're but... bringing back the 10th planet Cybermen, so <laughs> why not? <laughs> you can find us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Google Play, all at Trust Your Doctor. Leave a rating if you liked the show. Check us out on Facebook, Trust Your Doctor. Like us on Facebook. Also, check us out on Twitter at TYD Podcast and follow us on Twitter. And next week, we're listening to The Memory Cheats. But until then, the end. Thank you.